Hello and welcome back to our virtual classroom and another lesson in our trades training video series. I'm Joe Carswell and this lesson covers lumber for framing, so let's get right into it. Welcome to our channel. By now we've loaded almost 100 videos onto YouTube so that anyone can have access to structured trades training resources. We are really trying to grow this channel and the best way for that to happen is for you, the viewer, to subscribe. Also, if you learned something from these videos, don't forget to click like. So thanks for your support. Let's get back into the lesson. Let me start by saying that this lesson covers a lot of uh, detailed information. This will not be the most exciting lesson you have with us here, but it's very important information if you want to build and learning about all of this makes you a better builder. So to start with, our lumber for framing is going to be softwood trees. Uh, you, your other choice is hardwood. That doesn't work for framing. Hardwoods are, the trees are not big enough, the wood does not gr grow straight enough, and it's very dense. So it will not work for this framing process. Softwoods, on the other hand, the trees that come from are very tall and straight. We can cut nice straight boards out of them, and the wood is not so hard that we can't drive a fastener into it. So these softwoods that we use for framing lumber are all coniferous trees. That means they're cone bearing. Cone bearing trees do not have leaves. They have needles and they keep those needles all year long. So this is the ideal species of trees that we make our lumber out of. The growth cycle of a tree will make the grain in our lumber that we talked about earlier. The grain is literally the growth rings in the tree. So the growth cycle of the tree would be uh, in the spring, it's going to grow a lot good conditions, we've got milder climate, we've got a lot of water available. And then when we get to summer, the water kind of dries up and it gets really hot, so the tree will slow down in that growth period. So you're going to have the larger rings that we call spring wood. Those will be less dense and lighter colored. Then you'll have the more dense rings. Those are summer wood. Those, both of those put together make the entire growth ring set for this tree. And you might have heard when you were a kid, you can count the rings and figure out how, how many years or how old that tree is. This is exactly why, because you're counting the seasons with every set of those rings. This is what your growth rings look like when they're cut into a board. They turn into lines that we call wood grain. Bark is the outermost protective layer of the tree. It's not alive anymore, but it is holding out there to keep the weather out of the tree. The sapwood is this lighter region in the tree just inside of the bark. This is the living part of the tree. It's going to contain a lot of the water and it's the working part of the tree, the part that's keeping the whole thing alive. The reason I'm telling you about these parts right now will make a lot more sense when we start talking about how we cut boards out of this tree. So the interior part or the center part of this tree, we will call the heartwood. This is actually not living uh, material in the tree anymore. It used to be sapwood, it's turned into heartwood. This is a denser part of the tree and becomes really the structure of the tree. This is also important for our lumber. Here you see a stack of boards and it's very obvious this heartwood and sapwood difference. There's a color difference. The heartwood is always darker and the sapwood is always lighter. We need to cut boards out of this tree. It's round, we need square boards. There is a method to do it that will yield the most boards. We'll call it plain sawing. A lot of our framing lumber is plain sawed. It's a configuration that maximizes the amount of boards, minimizes the waste, and it would look something like this but depending on the, the shape and size of the boards, it could change around a little bit. Plain sawing does not necessarily make the most stable boards though. So depending on where that board is or where its position is in this log that was cut will determine which defects it might have and how that board will shape out in the end. If you notice any one of the boards that's cut out of this log, the arched grain in it will cause all kind of defects like cupping, bowing, crooks, uh, all of these things happen because the board is square, but the grain in it is kind of curved. Any boards that have an area in this sort of yellow dashed part might have a knot in it. So if you think about a tree, the knots are always on the outside. So these perimeter boards will also have knots in them. It's almost a given. 
So we've all seen checks and splits. You might not have looked at it this way before though. So if you look at the position of the boards and the radial pattern that those checks or splits will take, you can almost see in any board why that happens. A lot of times it happens because the tree, when it shrinks, will cause those checks. When we cut the boards this way, all of those lines can be drawn and you can almost point an arrow to the center of the tree from whatever board you're looking at. The species of the lumber we frame with has a lot to do with its strength, its weight, and uh, how easy it is to work with, also the kind of defects that you might see in it. So let's go through those one at a time, starting with probably the most popular one, which is Douglas fir. Uh, this one is a favorite of a lot of builders. It's strong, it's lightweight, it's affordable, and uh, it, it works well for this job of framing. Our second group would be spruce, pine, and fir, probably your second most common framing lumber. Uh, this is also very available, very affordable, and is, has generally smaller knots to it. Southern yellow pine is a weird group, and I know this one from coming from North Carolina. Uh, we have a town in North Carolina called Southern Pines, and I wonder what kind of wood they use. But anyway, southern pine or southern yellow pine is very dense. It's almost like iron. It's hard to drive a nail in. It splits very easily, but the strength specs on it are unbelievable. We'll look at those later. Western hemlock and uh, firs, this is our fourth group, not as common uh, here in the States. This is more of a finished wood, but it is also suitable for framing. And if it's available in your region, you might see studs made of this. So I hope I haven't worried you. I've given you some information about different types of species. You don't have to make that decision. That decision is often made in the set of plans. What we see here is a call out on a set of plans that calls out for number two or better, which is a grade. It also calls out the moisture content of the wood, and it also calls out some uh, strength specs for two different species. So this set of plants tells you exactly the type of lumber that you will be framing with. So this call out is in the general notes of the Jasper set of plans, which is a plan set that we offer. If you want a, a closer look at this set of plans and all of the notes and information in it, check out that lesson in plan reading. So one less thing to worry about, we don't need to be able to look at our lumber and to be able to identify just by sight, by looking at the grain or the color or any of that. We use lumber stamps to identify this lumber. And this is what a lumber stamp looks like. So you have four main categories here. One is going to be certification and origin of that lumber stamp. The second one would be the grade of that lumber. What's the quality of that lumber? The third would be our moisture content of that lumber. And the fourth one would be what species is that lumber? So in this case, our certification comes from an organization that's stamped here called Western Wood Products. That's WWP. Our grade on this lumber is grade two. Our moisture content is, this is kiln dried and it's also heat treated, which is an extra step in the process. And our species in this particular board is Douglas fir. And it also includes a group called larch. So it's Douglas fir larch. I've never seen a larch tree, but I know they exist. So I mentioned the certification agencies. These folks set the rules for identifying grading lumber. And the mill actually does the lumber grading, but these people set the rules. There's a lot of different agencies. They're all regional. And uh, I mentioned uh, Western Wood Products. There's a ton more. You might see Southern Pine Inspection Bureau, SPIB. You might see, uh, what's another one? WCLB, that would be West Coast Lumber Bureau. All of these groups do pretty much the same thing and make sure that the mills are grading and evaluating all of this lumber properly. Remember, this is a natural material that we have to mill down. So it requires us to evaluate it. We can't just cut it all up and send it out. Some of it might not be good enough for framing. Some of it might be really good. So we need to make that determination. Also, along with that certification agency stamp, there will be a mill number. It's important to know where this material came from. This gives us the exact mill that made this board. 
This is a really important one. The lumber grade will define what that piece of wood can be used for. And we noticed on our plans, it called for a grade two, uh, a grade two or better. That was what was in the language there. Our lumber is graded with different numbers. This happens to be a grade two. This is suitable for structural framing. So here you see a list of lumber grades. It goes anywhere from select, which is the best, to number one, to number two, to number three, or you might hear this called stud grade. And there's several below that, which would be construction, you'll see standard grade and utility grade in this order. So you have best to worst. And it's important to mention that stud grade or number three is the lowest grade you can use to frame with. When we're grading our boards, we're looking for defects and one defect like knots will weaken that board. So a stronger board will have less knots, a weaker board will have more knots and that will lower its grade. You can assume that a board within this, uh, these grading categories, construction, standard, or utility, will have a lot of knots in them. This is problematic for a lot of reasons, for strength and also trying to get fasteners on. Moisture content is a huge deal with wood. We saw it spelled out in the plans. Remember, trees are wet when you cut them down. So where does that water go? We have to uh, dry this board. You'll see different levels of moisture content spelled out with certain codes. You might see SGRN, which is surface green. You might see S dry, which is surface dry. You might see KD, which is kiln dried. You might see KDHT, which is kiln dried heat treated. You might see KD or MC15. That would be moisture content, 15% or kiln dried 15%. So let's take a look at what all that means and stack them up together. Starting with, you might have S green, that would be SGRN. This means that the board has had no drying and it would have a moisture content of 19% or more. That's a wet board and some boards, if they're green, when you hit them with a hammer, you're putting a, a nail in that'll actually spit wood or spit water out of them, kind of like an apple. S dry means surface dry, and this board would be under 19%. It's similar to kiln dried. Kiln dried is a process we put this, these boards in an oven and we cook them to reduce the moisture in them. Kiln dried would be maybe 16 to 19%, but under that 19% threshold, you might see MC15 or KD15. This would be an ultra low moisture board that would be under 15% uh, moisture content. There are some problems with working with wet wood. There's generally not a lot of problems working with drier wood, but what you add with the kiln drying process and some of these lower moisture content boards is you're adding cost to the board and cost is always an important factor when we're talking about lumber. The last part of this lumber stamp is that species. And this is great. It spells it out for us. We don't need to ID the wood ourselves. Uh, this uh, species, will be spelled out with an abbreviation or possibly a, an abbreviation with a symbol. You might see DFER or you might see SYP, that would be Southern Yellow Pine. You might see HEMFER, you might see SPF, that would be Spruce Pine Fir. So some abbreviations that get us to that species identification. Here's a list of our wood species in order of strength. These are specked out in uh, PSI and PSI is pounds per square inch. It's a way for us to evaluate how strong this, this wood is under load. You can see here, what I mentioned before was our southern pine was very dense, hard, and strong. It sits at the top of the list, but keep in mind this is for a select grade. There are no or very few knots in these boards, followed up by Douglas fir, that's our second one, and the other ones fall under those. If we go to a stud grade, which has a lot more knots, this is our minimum grade, for framing lumber, our southern pine, because of those knots, drops very quickly to the bottom of the scale for strength. Uh, in this particular species of wood, uh, knots in southern pine are no good. So this is a great example of how the species and the defects come together to affect the strength of the wood when we're talking about that grading. Let's take all of that information we learned and put it together and identify some of these lumber stamps. I'm looking at one here on my screen. This one is from Western Wood Products, WWP. The mill number is mill number 50. 
This board is a grade of number two, and it is a species of Douglas fir or larch. It also has a kiln-dried, heat-treated process that has been applied to it. Also in this stamp, you see one quarter EE, which means quarter inch eased edge. That's the radius around the corners of the board. The next stamp I have here is Timber Products Inspection Agency. Uh, it came from mill number 122. It is a number one grade. And this particular one is a species of Southern Yellow Pine, SYP. And it has been kiln dried and heat treated. Here's a kind of gnarly board. Uh, this one is stamped with Pacific Lumber Inspection Bureau. It has a mill number of W10. That's a little different. It is a construction grade board, which explains why it looks kind of funky. This is hemlock fir, uh, or it could be hemlock or Douglas fir. And it is S green, which means it has not been through any drying process at all. This board is very limited for use and certainly shouldn't be used for framing a house. This is a Western Wood Products board from mill 338. It is stud grade. It has been kiln dried and heat treated for insects. It is Douglas fir in a species, and it also has that quarter inch eased edge radius on, that, on all the corners. So here's a close up of that eased edge. We talked about this in a previous lesson. We are easing or radiusing these corners on these boards to help all of this framing go together better and for any materials that follow up to lay flatter on that framing. So thanks for sticking in on this long lecture about wood, about trees, about lumber stamps. This is really important information. Please take it to heart and learn it. It will help you to build better. And I hope that's the takeaway from this. Coming up, we have a lot of interesting materials that we call engineered wood. This will be a whole different world from what we've talked about with all of these natural materials. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. <laughs> let me, let me do that again. Let me, let me do that again. Sorry, that was really stupid. <laughs>